Hello and welcome and thank you for being with us today. I'm Jan Sigfusson and I've been associated with uh, evidence-based prevention for over 20 years. In the 90s, it was called Youth in Iceland, later Youth in Europe, and since the methodology caught international attention, Planet Youth. During the past months, we have experienced special times and we are all concerned about children's well-being and the effect of it they have. We have been in contact with our collaborators in several countries and everywhere people are inventing and finding new ways to protect children and to increase their well-being. There was a webinar last week or two weeks ago with our Australian and Irish colleagues who told us about their great work and the initiatives during COVID times. Today, we meet with our colleagues in Vermont and West Virginia in the States and colleagues from Lanark County in Canada to discuss the same topics as we did last night. First one, how is the COVID-19 pandemic impacting, impacting primary prevention? And secondly, how is primary prevention going to develop post-COVID-19 world. We hope that our initiative to share ideas from the Planet Partners be beneficial and we welcome our colleagues from USA and Canada today. Our people presenting here today are Holly Morehouse of Vermont, USA. She's the Executive Director of the Vermont After School. Um, Kevin Cloutier from Lana County, Canada. Kevin is the Vice Chair, Planet Youth Lanark County, and Executive Director at Open Doors for Lanark Children and Youth Out of Place. Tanya Holsal at the Youth Research Unit of the Royal Institute of Mental Health Research will also be with us. Um, we have received a report presentation and uh, we'll show that uh, to you online. Uh, we also have a colleague uh, from the same location in Lanark, David Sompi, the chair of Planet Youth Lanark County. And uh, finally, Alfgeir Christiansson, who is a colleague for, for many years, since 2003 or um, and now a program director and senior scientist at West Virginia University. I uh, thank you all for being here with us. The webinar is being recorded and will be available at our Planet Youth Facebook site and our website. You can send questions and comments through the meetings, uh, the live Q&A link, and we will forward them to the group. In case we will not be able to answer during the time of the session today, we will distribute the questions for discussion amongst participants. Now, I will not uh, take more time now and uh, to ask Holly Morris to take over and give us a briefing from Vermont on the two questions that I mentioned just. Um, we have had some interesting technical um, uh, challenges, um, so uh, we're not all on teams. Does that look? Holly, are you there? Jan, I'm here. And can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Good to see you. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity and, and hello to everyone um, out there. I um, appreciate uh, being part of this global community. Um, I pinned in on the discussion at the previous webinar with uh, Ireland, Australia, and um, and excited to be part of this conversation today with the US and Canada. I'm gonna start by sharing uh, my screen Moving over to the slide presentation. Uh, just a uh, context setting on uh, who we are and where we are. Uh, Vermont is a small world county in the northeastern part of the United States, Canada, uh, New York State, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. Our population statewide is about 640,000. Uh, the organization that I run is Vermont Africa. We are a statewide non-government organization that's been around for about a decade. 
Uh, we work um, with state agencies, schools, community organizations, towns, and other partners on serving children and youth um, ages 5 to 26, so into that young adult age. Um, primarily outside the school day and over the summer. And I know in Iceland, they refer to that as sort of leisure time. Um, in Vermont, we talk about it as the third space for learning and growth. First space being the home environment, the second space being school and formal education system, and the third space being everything else um, outside of that that is so important to the growth and development of our young people. As far as uh, the COVID situation in, in Vermont, um, we're, we're doing okay at the moment. Um, our efforts in our state, we have managed to avoid surges. Uh, we are now in this situation where uh, we've increased testing, um, but we're not having to show up every day. Um, we are bordered though by hot spots, little maps of uh, uh, the uh, epidemic, uh, especially around New York State, New Jersey. Connecticut, Massachusetts. So all of our neighbors um, are still um, experiencing hot spots um, in areas. So um, and our borders, our state borders are open and Vermont is a large destination in the summer. So um, those are all uh, things that we're following. The border, our northern border with Canada still remains um, closed at this time. So looking at that context, um, you know, starting being pocket of uh, under COVID control right now, um, but also being very wary of a return or a peak. Um, we really find our policy shifting um, in the state um, as it is in many places. Week to week, sometimes it feels hour to hour. Um, some of the things that we have uh, seen and continue to uh, talk about as priorities: uh, food delivery. Um, we are talking about food insecurity in our state being up by about fifty percent. Um, people lining up for miles at food pickup, food pickup um, situations. Uh, as far as children and youth, our entire school system, so our schools and all our businesses, um, our state went into a, a emergency uh, uh, situation in March. All of our schools shut down, and the attention focused to meal delivery. So we're using our buses um, and staff. Often our after school or time staff have jumped into the schools uh, to deliver meals every day uh, to children and youth um, throughout the community. Um, we are a largely rural state as well, so those, those bus routes are very important at this time. Um, when the governor of Vermont issued the stay at home, stay safe order, uh, the exemptions were for essential needs, uh, grocery store, uh, medical appointments. Forth, and physical activity was included in that list. Um, we have not had the big push around hugging trees that we've seen in Iceland, although we have appreciated that greatly. Uh, we have spent a lot of time around primary prevention about physical and mental wellness and um, getting uh, people out individually and helping families um, with their children and youth to enjoy our community and continue to be active. We've also seen a lot of messaging from our state health agency around other substance misuse efforts, uh, particularly focusing on vaping and smoking and using the connection in COVID uh, to the respiratory issues to really get people to rethink um, some of those behaviors and uh, use this opportunity to, to perhaps change their habits. Um, Another area around children and youth that we are very concerned about in the uh, primary prevention world are uh, child abuse and neglect. Um, now that children and youth are all at home, um, when those homes are um, unstable or difficult situations, um, we're concerned about what the children and youth are experiencing. Um, in March of this year, reports of child abuse and neglect were down by 30%. And in April, they were down by 50%. Um, and you know, not 100% sure yet of what that causality is, but concerned that it um, may be linked to underreporting um, 
as there are not caring adults that youth are coming in contact with or seeing what's going on. Our whole school systems have focused on continuity of learning and moved to online learning. Uh, it has been very even across our state, uh, raising serious concerns about learning disparities. Uh, basic issues from just internet broadband access does not exist in our areas um, to low attendance rates um, in some schools and very differing approaches from one community to the next and how learning education has been approached over the last uh, so um, on the upside, I will say the after school leisure time staff that we work uh, very closely throughout the state and has adapted and responded in so many amazing creative ways. Um, it truly has been inspiring uh, to see some of them move into providing child care uh, for the children of essential workers, hospital workers uh, during this time. Uh, many of them shifted over to the food delivery system that we talked about. They became partners with schools. Um, going through the entire student population list and working through has everybody been heard from, has everybody seen each one of these children and where the gaps were, making sure they reached out and made connections with every young person in their community. Um, and then also offering virtual programming. Uh, sometimes there are hangout spaces for young people to get together and share music and talk or affinity groups or uh, play chess um, remotely. Uh, sometimes they've been very uh, active and um, enrichment programming. They'll, they're using the delivery system to send home supplies for activities to children and youth, and then setting times to be on the computer and to engage in activities um, with children and, and youth across the state. Um, and to take some of the load off of parents, um, we're also now in school as well as trying to work at home. So really interesting creative approaches uh, to reaching young people. A few weeks ago, um, we had a statewide virtual in Vermont, and we invited young people ages uh, 9 to 19 uh, to participate um, in this forum. Uh, we had 27 young people from all parts of the state, and they were asked to reflect and tell their story, uh, what they're experiencing during COVID, what they're concerned about, what ideas they have for policymakers moving forward. Um, and over and over again in that testimony, um, young people spoke to isolation, loneliness. Um, there were stories of being you know, disconnected from other family members like grandparents. Um, even a story about when separated because one of them had health issues that the other one did um, disconnect from friends. Uh, and then a, 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 a struggle around how to be part of the solution moving forward. Um, our um, clinic district in Vermont is about a year old. Uh, voice has been a strong part of our project from the beginning. Um, and so using this opportunity really to elevate uh, what young people have to say and are experiencing so that our decision makers are taking that into account um, as, as they're uh, moving policies and funding decisions forward. We have also been experimenting with some of that decision power to young people themselves. We have um, established youth councils that have budgets that participate in participatory budgeting processes. We have uh, borrowed from Finland, um, where young people are actually coming up and proposing solutions for things that would help their young people in their communities right now and recovering from COVID. Um, and then they vote on how the dollars should be spent. What ideas should be put forward um, in the community. And we found that to be both powerful and creating creative solutions for the community, but also young people having a, a increased sense of agency in part of the solution. Um, our uh, youth serving activity, sorry about that, um, organization, you know, our, some of them are financially able, um, have been able to retain staff. Others have had to follow staff or close. So there's a lot of conversations about how and when um, to reopen, uh, how financing can be done in the state to ensure that the field remains stable is there once we're in the crisis and uh, to serve uh, children, youth, and families. Um, I talked a bit already about the virtual programming. Um, and our, our latest development is that in-person programming and leisure activities are some of 
have received the go ahead governor to start reopening on June 1st. Um, we have new health guidelines in place and how to do that. Um, most of them, I'd say, are looking a little bit further into June with the reopening. Access to safety supplies, uh, cleaning supplies, used to be a, a barrier in some areas, as well as space. Uh, many of the uh, programs utilize school spaces. Some of the schools are not um, opening yet to allow programming for the summer. So there's a lot of negotiation in the community for how we best reach our children during this time. Our current youth activities, we have six pilot sites in Vermont. Uh, they've been operating for about a year. Um, and some of our, our findings uh, that came back from our data in the fall are around high levels of, of cannabis and alcohol. Use uh, low levels, exception of harm, um, low access to leisure time or activities. And then other really key things that we found in Vermont that young people were spending a lot of time with their parents. So that wasn't the issue for us, but it was that the parents were not connected to each other with that co collaboration, co communication piece. And so that is something that our communities had really started working on in January pretty intentionally. And when the, when COVID hit, we were concerned about what would happen to our climate youth activities. I have actually found that that, that avenue around uh, parents communicating and co-collaborating has actually had stronger bandwidth. Um, these, co these conversations about how you can people in your, your teenager state when you don't have common norms with other parents and across your community have really arisen. Um, to higher levels um, and, and need for conversation. You know, whether teenagers who are dating can they meet, which friends can go out. And as now as Vermont starts to reopen, it's even more important for parents to have communication uh, between each other and to set all around this context of keeping and being safe. Um, and so our communities are really working on how to establish those parent groups and then hopefully come fall to leverage them even further around substance misuse and other uh, protective factors that we want to work on. Uh, some of the activities we've been doing are articles, social media groups, seminars, school packets, school coffee hours for parents to get together uh, virtually and just talk about what it's like to parent during COVID and what we're seeing with young people. And starting in June, we're going to be using these virtual parent forums in each community, really focused on youth mental health and protective protect this will be formed where parents can come um, together and share testimony with state legislators, policymakers on what they're concerned about and what they're seeing um, with their youth. So I am going to stop there and pass off to you um, our other colleagues. We also have our colleagues and friends uh, from the um, from county. Um, and, yeah, and, and David, um, we have a, um, a video about eight minutes long that uh, uh, I have presented and uh, I will thank you already on YouTube. Uh, but I uh, was wondering if uh, maybe you would uh, start a little bit and, and uh, tell us about what, uh, what you're doing in, in Lanark. Just, just open up. Thank you, John. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today and and to share some uh, information about our, our responses uh, within Lanark County uh, to the uh, pandemic. And um, um, it's uh, I, I applaud you and your ingenuity to be able to bring all of us together using these various platforms and uh, communicating. Uh, sounds so simple in theory and in practice, uh, there's always some kind of uh, an opportunity to learn. So uh, very much appreciate all of your, your effort and work. As you mentioned, Tanya is uh, going to be on YouTube and uh, we, we are uh, being joined by our uh, chairperson, uh, David Sompi this morning or this afternoon. And, and we're very happy to, uh, to be part of this uh, collaborative uh, storytelling of uh, how we are uh, coping with our current situations. Uh, you mentioned that we're from Lanark County. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, is is the slide deck available? 
if you can pull up the slide deck and then we can uh, I can uh, be the orchestra conductor. Um, that would be lovely. Um, while while the slide deck's coming up, I'll just uh, set us within a geographic context. Uh, actually, Holly, we're only about uh, three hours or thereabouts uh, from from your location in Vermont. Um, we're just uh, west of Ottawa, uh, the national capital, and uh, uh, we have a uh, population of approximately 70,000 people. Uh, uh, that is a uh, rural center uh, with uh, three uh, smallish communities uh, that have uh, that that's, uh, are roughly between 10 and 15,000 per community. Um, uh, that form the uh, the urban cores, if you if you would like. Um, it's it's been traditionally a a rural community, um, and um, over the past oh, three four years, it has been in transition. Uh, you could certainly say that we are becoming uh, 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 bedroom communities for uh, uh, Ottawa as people migrate out of the. Uh, uh, urban area of approximately a million people and uh, into a, a lower, a slower life <clears throat> and an opportunity to be able to enjoy some uh, of the uh, benefits of uh, uh, rural lifestyle. Um, much of much of what has been uh, uh, going on with regard to uh, healthcare service delivery, at least in mental health and and uh, um, uh, addictions uh, has been coordinated through uh, a local uh, co uh, collaboration of uh, services. Uh, just to offer you an idea of, uh, of how things have been, uh, we've, there was a report done a few years ago, 2017 exact, uh, a vital signs report that asked citizens of uh, Leonard County, um, which is the most vulnerable population currently uh, with, within the county and 40% of the people uh, identified uh, youth as uh, the, the the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. did, did you want to do Tanya first, and then and then we'll go with my life uh, slides. Uh, however you want. Uh, you've got Tanya's slides there, so how about we do that, and then uh, uh, we can get uh, my slides uploaded so that uh, we can follow the okay. story okay. subsequent to her research. Deb, all right. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. So I've been involved with Planet Youth Leonard County for about a year now, and my role has been to support the research and evaluation activities. Um, my background is generally in evaluation research within community settings, uh, mainly looking at youth focused programs and uh, positive youth development and mental health promotion. I'm also interested in uh, evaluation with complex system interventions and using ecological approaches. So when I found out that the Icelandic model was being implemented in Lanark County, I was very excited to become involved. So the first project that I was involved with is an evaluation framework that was funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, so the original intentions for the framework were to support scaling across the country, as well as to create a foundation for the evaluation research in Lanark County. Um, the project uh, evolved a fair amount and it landed at, as being generally an evaluation guide. So there's sort of an evaluation capacity building section, um, reviewing the basics of evaluation like logic models and indicators and how to use them and how to apply them in com complex interventions. And it's mainly focused on implementation kinds of issues. So looking at what adaptations have been made and how the model has been implemented and how it compares with you know, the five guiding principles and the 10 core steps. Um, the Public Health Agency of Canada was also quite interested in looking at positive mental health and whether the model is influential on, on youth well-being and, and general mental health. Um, and it's, it's somewhat intuitive to assume that, um, you know, the risk and protective factors that influence substance use are also associated to, um, you know, positive youth development and uh, good functioning as individuals. So. 
So the guide is just about finished at this point, and essentially it should be useful, hopefully will be useful, to raise awareness about the model, as well as to be, um, you know, something that, that folks who are partnering with the Icelandic Centre for Social Research and Analysis can use in implementing the Icelandic model, as well as for communities that may not have the opportunity to partner but would like to implement an initiative that's somewhat similar and utilizes some of the same principles. So we've recently also um, been awarded some federal funding to actually implement this evaluation framework in Lanark County. And this funding opportunity is a patient-oriented research uh, funding that essentially is designed to help researchers collaborate with, with um, service consumers, so patients, or in our case, because it's a public health kind of initiative, it's the general youth population. And so the research and um, evaluation activities will largely focus on how Lanark County is able to engage youth. And that's actually a unique aspect of Planet Youth Lanark County in that youth are becoming a key stakeholder in the process and will help to inform decision making around how, uh, what strategies are selected and how it's implemented. So a lot of the research will look at how is that done, what processes are put in place, what lessons learned are achieved, and um, essentially it, would also, it will also look at what are youth impressions about these sorts of things. So how do they perceive substance use issues in the community and um, you know, what kind of reasoning do they have behind that and how, how are they able to explain why it's happening, as well as um, you know, when the strategy is implemented, how is it influencing them and what is their experience of that? Um, in addition, they will create, uh, will engage them in the research as a participatory component. So the youth will be able to select questions of interest and be able to um, investigate those issues. Uh, the, the evaluation research will also look at whether the Icelandic model does have an influence on mental health, as well as look quite a bit more in depth at implementation. So uh, the research applies a couple of implementation science frameworks, both um, the National Implementation Research Network, they have some tools and um, frameworks that are useful, as well as the quality implementation framework. Uh, both of these apply implementation research and have created resources that are useful at looking at implementation within community setting. Um, which is an important adaptation because I find a lot of implementation research is, is quite linear and, and, and assumes a top-down model within organizations. But when you're looking at a collaborative setting, uh, you, you really have to be uh, using a more participatory approach and, and following grassroots because, you, you know, you look at there will be power differentials and differences in buy-in and lots of other um, sort of influences, like, for example, a pandemic um, that needs to be considered. Uh, so beyond the, the general evaluation that's been developed, uh, we're also looking at a new funding opportunity to examine how, um, how the community has experienced the pandemic and to adapt the, the strategy to be able to respond to it. So we, we're hoping to implement the survey when students go back in the fall, if they go back in the fall. Um, and so it'll be a really good opportunity to look at, you know, what's been going on in the community, how are folks transitioning back to a more regular daily life, and hopefully also serves as an opportunity to identify um, what needs exist in the community and how we can respond to them. Um, certainly, a lot of this will come out in the evaluation, regardless of whether we're successful in um, identifying new funds or um, accessing new funds, just because, you know, the, this will this has already been a huge influence in our project. And uh, similar to Ireland, having um, uh, physical distancing and, and you know, pandemic-related influences impact their intervention and sort of acting as a confounding variable for us, it will influence our baseline measurements. So I'm curious to see, um, I'm curious to see uh, what we'll find when we do get started. 
Um, just yesterday, there was um, a new study, uh, an article. So the study hasn't been published yet, but there was a, an article in Toronto Star on a study that's been conducted with the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, and they looked at um, how COVID-19 has influenced youth mental health and substance use. And they have actually quite quite interesting findings. So, you know, they, they saw an increase in things like depression and anxiety and um, suicidal thoughts, sort of a range of, of different mental health issues. Um, and but they also found that uh, there were some positive impacts. So there was reduce a reduction in substance use behaviors in youth. Um likely because they're at home with their family and they don't have the opportunities to, you know, go to a pub or go to, uh, you know, a, a school dance or wherever, wherever they are using substances. Um, and, and there were also some benefits that were identified. So, you know, the youth were able to step out of the rat race and experience some stress relief because they, they aren't dealing with school and work pressures and they're spending more time with their family and are also have more free time to sort of engage in like hobbies and relaxation activities. So I'm anticipating that for Planet Youth Leonard County, we'll also see some, some mixed influences and looking forward to um, seeing what we find. So thank you very much for having me and apologize that I wasn't able to provide live uh, presentation. So uh, Tanya has certainly uh, described the scaffold of uh, research initiatives that are ongoing around our uh, Planet Youth Lanner County and uh, the, the work that uh, we are looking to be able to uh, contribute to the well-being and uh, life trajectory of uh, children and youth in the county and the knowledge that is uh, being uh, accumulated with regard to uh, Planet Youth as we go forward. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, this has not been the result of uh, Tanya, David and, and our efforts. This has been a tremendous grassroots community uh, opportunity that was uh, ve very much uh, uh, a response to the kinds of information that uh, was being received in a number of different uh, aspects of, of uh, uh, the community. I mentioned the Vital Signs Report. Uh, public health data was showing that 24% of grade seven students had experimented with alcohol and 20% of uh, grade nine students had experimented with cannabis. So we wanted to do something as a community to, to make a huge difference. And, um, uh, since 1917, this group of concerned organizations and citizens have come together so that in 2020, we've, we've achieved and, and arrived at a place that we feel is very, uh, uh, very uh, positive for, for the community. We have our research, um, our service agreement with uh, EXTRA uh, for five years, and we are all set up with our uh, collaboration for grade nine student access to complete the surveys with uh, both of our local school boards. And uh, we are the first community in Canada to be able to accomplish this uh, this uh, marvelous feat. And then March 15th and COVID. Next uh, slide, please. So I just want to take a look at it a little bit from a uh, mental health perspective. As, as uh, was mentioned in my introduction by John, I am the executive director of Open Doors for Lanark Children and Youth, which is the provider for mental health services uh, within the county for uh, children and youth to the age of 18. And these are the types of services that we provide uh, on the left-hand side of this slide. So um, we do about 1,400 new intakes per year and the graph shows you that for the year 20 uh for the fiscal year uh april 1 19 to uh, march 2020 uh, 20, uh the pattern of referrals that we had uh, over the course of uh of that year and then between march and april when things should be really spiking because the school year is coming to uh, uh, a conclusion in june it dropped right off the table and we had but 28 uh, referrals only. So uh, COVID was really a huge impact. Social distancing, schools closing, we don't have access in the same ways as we had previously. Um, 
very much in a lockdown like uh, so many other places around the world uh, as they move through their initial uh, responses and uh, to uh, control the transmission of, uh, of the virus. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So we really had to pivot, and one of the ways that we pivoted was was to become a virtual organization. We are still providing the services that were highlighted on the earlier slide. Um, however, we're doing it through virtual platforms and telephonic uh, uh, platforms. Our, our uh, referrals during May uh, have gone back up to 58, and they're continuing to climb from that point. The other thing that we've really done, uh, in addition to uh, providing uh, mental health uh, counseling services to children, youth, and their families, is we've really moved into a preventative uh, uh, space as well. Uh, as you can see from this particular slide, there's a young fellow on the uh, on the large uh, screen from Facebook. He is one of our youth engagement youth, and, and he's uh, presenting a video on our Wellness Wednesdays program that is an outreach uh, to Lanark and beyond, that w in which he is describing what he's doing in order to sustain uh, his health and mental health during the uh, uh, COVID pandemic. And if you look on the right, there are a number of related videos that are hosted by our staff who are going out to provide uh, people with information about how to manage that anxiety that was being uh, expressed by uh, by Tanya in, in her uh, uh, presentation, how to manage uh, and not slip into uh, depression through the use of mindfulness, through the use of uh, being able to self-regulate. And we also have a lot of Q&A sessions with, with individuals as well, so that we both live and, and, and through uh, text, so that we can engage the community as much as possible while still keeping our social distance. Next slide, please. Um, but there's no denying that there has been tremendous impact from uh, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Um, as, as Tanya indicated from the Toronto Star uh, um, Center for Addiction and Mental Health, study. Uh, this this previous one uh, completed by Ipsos Reid that was sponsored by Children's Mental Health Ontario and Addictions Mental Health Ontario uh, indicated that 67% uh, of uh, Ontarians feel that this is going to be a serious and long-lasting impact upon the health and mental health of uh, children and youth. And in addition, uh, as you can see, um, on the right-hand side, since May 2020, as a result of um, distribution of toxic uh, pur purple uh, fentanyl, there have been three deaths. And we know the connection between diminished um, and vulnerabilities of mental health problems and the issues associated with substance, uh, substance use. So we've got everything set up, we're ready to go, COVID hits, now we're waiting for September whenever we can re reconnect with our schools. The anticipation is that that'll connect, uh, re re recommence in the fall, and we can begin to work again with our partners to really get a sense at the, at the very front end of the impact of COVID and how we might be able to organize our community responses to uh, according to the methodology of Planet Youth. That's my story. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. I think, I think uh, given the time we have left, we should uh, switch to uh, Alger now, our colleague Alger Christensen in uh, West Virginia. I am here. You're there, welcome. Can you see and hear me good? Yes. So, uh, all right, I see that we are um, close in on time. So uh, let me just give you a brief overview of um, the um, Icelandic model implementation here in, in West Virginia. Um, obviously, I could talk about this for three days, uh, particularly uh, because this has been a built up process. Um, can you hear me good? You, you can? Yeah, okay, okay, good, good, good. It's kind of odd to try to interact, you know, when you have very little indication of that. Um, so to cut a long story short, I've been for eight years. This is my eighth year in, in West Virginia uh, this summer. And since I came here, we've been um, educating both our colleagues, the public, and certainly uh, practitioners and policymakers at several levels uh, a, 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 with regards to the Icelandic prevention model and sort of our attempts to get in um, 
into the system and um, um, get people to understand that we really don't believe and don't think that short-term programs are going to get us anywhere. Um, that's very much been the norm here as, as long as I can remember. Um, after several attempts, several different data collections, disseminations, and um, bridging of um, relationships with local communities, we, we came to realize that we had to turn around our focus and acquire both long-term funding, as we have always been arguing for, and um, the ability to fund local boots on the ground work. Um, it's, it's hard coming from a large institution like the university to sort of go into local communities, collect data, and then assume that you can create some kind of bottom-up feasibility. So, I think the first several years of our experience here was around this um, uh, situation. Last year, we acquired a promise of a five-year grant from the CDC, which is for community-based implementation research and, um, and um, um, approaches. And we began um, collaborating with two counties. Uh, in West Virginia, West Virginia is one of the rural states. It's the only state in, in the country that is solely confined within the area called Appalachia. Um, it's very much a rural state with a number of small towns. Total population is about 1.7 million, but um, um, and the, the largest cities or towns include 50 to 80,000 people. People here very commonly refer to themselves by county. So things are about which county are you from? And uh, that's where the educational systems are controlled. That's where a lot of the administrative work takes place and so on and so forth. We paired up for this five-year commitment to two counties and they were selected both based on need, but also based on current infrastructure. And I think this is very important because if you review uh, the five guiding principles and the 10 steps to implementation of the Icelandic model, we know and we have learned by experience over a long period of time that we really need to have solid, strong local commitment in order to get anything moving. So our current infrastructure within those counties are that we have local um, county coordinators that really are the local movers and shakers. These are counties that include 20 to 30,000 people, so they're not large by a population. Our research team oversees things from the university, but then we have a coordinator at our level that really is the principal communicator with the counties. And this individual is the one that pushes the timeline, that pushes the program that we have arranged with regards to both research, dissemination and implementation, and runs bi-weekly meetings with our community coordinators. Those meetings also are very important when they, the community folks, really need additional support. If they need meetings about communication systems or how to reach out to parental groups or how to acquire relationships with schools or, you know, what it really whatever is, is, is taking place. And then our community experts on our team, uh, Mike Mann and Megan Smith, they gear in on those meetings to provide this additional layer of support. We've also been acquiring process-based data from them from the, for the last two months. And that's given us a really interesting additional overlook on how things have been going within the two counties. Um, our first round of data collection was in October and November of last year, and they had their full uh, reports disseminated to them in the end of, by the end of January, early February. Now, when COVID hits in West Virginia, uh, we were probably one of the best states to live in um, because uh, around here, a lot of things move around the university. The university is far and away the biggest institution in the state. It, uh, here in Morgantown on the northern border, Pennsylvania border, uh, we have about 35,000 students and about 70,000 people in the, in the town. So this is very much a college town. 
COVID hits about 10 days prior to spring break. And what happens in American colleges in, during spring break is that everybody goes to their home. Now, our students live everywhere. They don't live in West Virginia exclusively. They live in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia, the Carolinas, and so on and so forth. So the university was faced with the notion that we would have 35,000 individuals spread out into the country and then come back. So they made a decision then to close the university and they gave the um, students two options. You either leave or stay away or you stay here and don't leave at all. And everything was moved online. And this was done prior to the first case being detected in West Virginia. So we were well established in terms of reaction. Testing here was late and slow going and the setup and organization was, was chaotic and the rest of it like in many other parts of, of, of the country. But I think the main issue with regards to this procedure is most of the state followed suit from the university policy. Schools were closed and so on and so forth. And the usual, as in large parts of America, you know, around youth took place with regards to backpack lunches and home schools and so on and so forth. So this has been a this has been a challenge. But with regards to our work around the Icelandic model, I just wanted to give you a few updates, uh, sort of around what we've been doing. And I think timing is really important because just before COVID hits, we had disseminated our school and community-based reports to our community liaisons, to our community coordinators. Now, being mindful of the fact that these people are really working with the Icelandic model for the first time, there are solid community-based prevention teams in both counties, but they have never worked in this area. They are used to the idea of running short-term programs all the time and basically be sort of the, what we often refer to as the band-aid methods, the sort of repeated band-aid methods. So for them, um, having access to this data that allows them to make priorities and set strategies and really distinguish between school communities within their counties has been a major game changer. And just a few things, I, I know that we are close on time, so I'm just gonna mention to you a few things that have been really interesting for us to observe. Um, the process data that we garner from them every month is basically information around how many meetings have you run? Who are attending these meetings? How are you arranging them? Are you using the data to acquire other funding? And so on and so forth. There's just lots of different things that are taking place with that. And our project manager up at the university really pushes this on to the local county so they can tell us and indicate uh, what's happening with them. They've already set up a number of school meetings uh, via Zoom, and they met with their folks, uh, mostly faculty and leadership, uh, principals and other leaders online. And uh, as we have often experienced before, the information is, is, is garnering lots of attention between them. They are now working on setting up and arranging meetings with other stakeholders uh, to the table, and those have been taking place via Zoom mostly, or 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 uh, via the internet, internet dis uh, distance meetings, and and so far they have been successful because you know people are still at work even though they are not necessarily within their schools. Um, the data has almost immediately uh, received a really great deal of attention about the lack of resources because the state faces very much difficulties in resources both to children themselves but also into the homes because West Virginia has been one of those states that has been really badly hit by the opioid crisis. So it seems to us that, uh, you know, I, I, I a um, appropriate way to tackle and focus on primary prevention is really to underline the importance that we need a lot of additional support to the home life. We need greater level of treatment options. We need much more uh, in, in, uh, opportunity for transportation and so on and so forth. And this, this is only solidified and underlined the importance. Uh, currently, uh, meetings with town council folks and policy-based leaders are being planned uh, in both counties. And like I said, the data really is the driver 
in acquiring this information because you know you when you have the data in the reports that are only two or three months old you really have solid ammunition in your hands to acquire attention from people that have local powers and we see that this has been a big mover and shaker already with our colleagues in those two counties um, in the larger county, there was already a meeting with over 100 people, and those included people from law enforcement, schools, the health sector, certainly education, local councils, politicians, and so on and so forth. And principal meetings have taken place as well or are being set up. Now, as I'm sure you all know, we are always fighting uh, budget issues as everybody is in these as areas. But now with this data information, they have been able to create opportunities to meet with local uh, chambers of commerce, for example, and local businesses. Because, you know, local businesses care about their local communities. And that's typically a strength in rural areas that you have a stronger locale or a st stronger feel for, for local responsibility. And the data is already serving that, that purpose. Both counties have then also arranged Facebook pages and one of them also Instagram pages. And what they do through those social media platforms is they send teasers, regular teasers with the data. So, you know, let's all be remindful now that vaping has increased and this and that has increased. So, and, and obviously, in, in especially in the COVID era, social media becomes a centralized platform to try to distribute these findings um, in greater um, capacity. So, so that's been a, a, a big help. In, in the larger county, they are already underway applying for further funding using the data, because obviously once you have local data, then you can really drill down on where the problems are. And that, that's another way that the data has, has provided sort of a glue to further work. <laughs> And, um, and um, uh, yeah, all the grant applications are, are now being, being apply, applied for. And Fayette County, which is one of those counties, uh, interesting to me, they have now changed the title of their group from the Fayette County Substance Abuse Task Force to the Fayette County Prevention Coalition. And I, I think that's sort of a testament to a change in direction. They are, they're trying to be much more focused on the preventive side of things instead of being always on the reacting or reaction um, side of things. I believe that I have only about a minute uh, more. So let me just tell you uh, a couple things about uh, uh, the social media presence. What the social media presence also does and has helped us do is to is to acquire more information from parents because parents and caregivers can reply with information through this medium. And that's sort of where we stand currently uh, with regards to uh, the uh, implementation here. In uh, really, really interesting. All your work with. It's obvious that there are similar challenges handled in, in many different ways. Uh, by the way, we had promised uh, a Q&A, but the technology was also uh, not uh, with us there. And uh, you, if there are questions and issues you want to bring up, those who are listening in, then you can always reach us through the Planet Youth website and we can questions from there. Um, as the time is almost up, uh, we need to end the session. However, before that, I would like to mention that um, the pandemic caused by COVID has had serious effects on the way we live and will most likely do so for years to come. We must, however, constantly be reminded that there is another pandemic that we need to continue fighting. It's a pandemic that has been ongoing for strong years killing hundreds of children and young people every day, every day of the year. Drugs. Our work, our mission, therefore, is crystal clear and uh, we, we must continue that. Once again, thank you very much for participating. Stay safe and uh, see you again. Thank you. Goodbye.